All right. So anyone that knows me pretty well, and some of y'all don't know me well, I like to ask a lot of questions. I like to ask why, and I like to know how, and I like to see how things connect together. So one of the big questions I've been asking myself lately is, why did I voluntarily sign up to preach? Like, I mean, Pastor Jerome was already pretty good. Why would I decide to also come up here? And how did I let him convince me? But he's a wordsmith, right? So, no, he didn't really have to convince me at all. But I did do it not actually knowing what I would be preaching on. But it just so happens that where we are in our chosen series, that we're actually talking from one of two primary texts that explains what a healthy church looks like. And since I spent a lot of time working and praying and trying to understand how I can best help serve our body, I'm really excited to talk to you about what I've been learning. So the title of this sermon is Chosen for Unity. Chosen for Unity. And so we're going to go ahead and start off with uh, verse uh, 1 through 3. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity in the bonds of peace. So Paul starts off chapter 4 in Ephesians with the word, therefore, right? And so therefore, particularly in Ephesians, is meaning that everything before he gets to that therefore is all culminating up to this point. Right? And that is super important because the first churches that would have been listening to this, the church at Ephesus, they wouldn't have started with Paul at chapter 4 saying, hey, live like this. They would have gotten a culmination of everything in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And so I'm going to try to do a really quick recap so that we can kind of get what the church at Ephesus would have been receiving by the time they got to this point of being called to do something. So in chapter 1, this chapter is talking about orthodoxy or understanding the right belief. And that is talking about the right belief that in Christ, the fullness of everything dwells. And that is for the benefit of his church and his glory, for him to fill it up in every way. So a quick way that we can say and uh, just bring a summary of chapter one together is Christ is in charge. And if you believe in Christ, you are within him. Chapter two then breaks down into a space where Paul is telling us who we were before we knew Christ. So before we knew Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And as non-Jews, we had no hope to claim any of the promises of God that we saw in the Old Testament. But God being rich in mercy and love for us has made us alive in Christ and saved us by grace through faith, not by anything that we could do ourselves. This is what brings him down to chapter 3 where he starts to talk about orthopathy or the right of emotional space that we should be in in light of this truth. And then Paul lets us know that Christ, and he prays for us, and this is what uh, Elder Candidate Sean was talking about last week towards the end of chapter 3, where Paul bows down and surrender to the Spirit and asks that we be strengthened by the Spirit in our innermost being, that Christ may dwell in our hearts richly through faith, that we may be rooted and firmly established in love, that we may be able to comprehend with the saints in unity the length, the width, the height, the depth of God's love, and for us to know the surpassing knowledge and that we may be filled with the fullness of God in love. Once Paul says this, he says this, and if you grew up in church, you've heard this maybe a few uh, times, but he asked that God would do above and beyond all that we can ask or imagine and for him to get all of the glory from it. Paul says all of this to lead us to the therefore in chapter four, because Paul knows that we can't intimately be aware of living like Christ unless we have the transformative power of Christ in our lives. And it's just like a power socket. If you have uh, something in your house, maybe say a blender, right? You buy the blender, you know what the blender is for? It's to blend, right? You bring the blender in your house, but if you ain't got no electricity and it doesn't come with a power strip, that blender is of no use to you. It can't do anything for you. And that's basically what we have to realize as Christians, right? For our traits and for us to change and for us to be able to walk in the things that God has called us to, we might be able to put a battery in our back, and that's an urban way to say that we might be able to self-will ourselves through something. But we can change a trait for a day, 
You might be able to change it for a week. If you have some really strong self-will, you might be able to change it for a few years. But only Christ transforms our hearts for an eternity. And if we're going to live in all humility in gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And, man, y'all, when Paul says bearing with one another in love, I love that because that's just honest, right? Because sometimes we can just be unbearable. Like, some of y'all might not know how unbearable I can be, but I can promise you my wife, Ebony, knows that I can be unbearable, right? So he's just being honest, and that's saying we have to put up with one another for the sake of love and unity. And not only that, but Paul is also intimately aware that for us to be able to live like Christ, we have to know that Jesus isn't holding back from us. He's not holding us at arm's length, but he's embracing his children extravagantly in love so that we can live and walk in the calling that he has called us to. And not only will we be able to walk in that, but we'll be able to connect with one another and those that don't know Christ in a way that glorifies him. This type of connection and community that God has called his beloved children to leads me to our thought tattoo for the day. Christ has united us in community to display his divinity. Now, I know y'all might be thinking, well, you know, there's plenty of different people that are connected in community that are uniting around something, right? You got people that have hobbies, whether that's music or sports or doing entertainment or professional organizations that get together, lawyers getting together with lawyers, doctors getting together with doctors. And even unfortunately, we have people that are united by their hate. We just saw this last week when we see things like the Buffalo shootings. When we see people that are getting together in chat rooms and all of these different things that are united by hate. But what makes the church any different? This leads me to my next point. We're chosen for distinction. And let's look at verses 4 through uh, verse 6. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So Paul lays out seven unique and distinct beliefs that we have as believers that unite us as children of God. So the first one would be a spiritual distinction that we see in verse 4. There is one body and there is one spirit. So as Christians, everything that we do should be steeped and saturated in the oneness that we have in Christ. As we said, that connection. And that's because each one of us as believers that are a part of this one body whose head is Christ share the spiritual distinction that comes with the seal on our lives. Literally, and I'm talking about an actual seal that's called the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 4 verse 30, Paul lets us know that as Christ followers, we have a seal called the Holy Spirit that guarantees us when we're redeemed at the end of time when Jesus returns. What does the seal do? A seal authenticates. That means that a seal makes sure that something isn't fake or a facade. A seal secures. A seal holds things together to make sure that it's secure. And then a seal protects. A seal protects something from being tampered with. So if you are in Christ, you are signed, sealed, and fully, will be fully delivered when Christ returns at the point of our redemption. We're also marked by a distinction of belief. Our spiritual distinction comes with a clear set of beliefs that act as guardrails for us to let us know when we're in and out of bounds as a community of believers. So me and my wife were about to have a baby boy, really excited about it. Yeah, thank y'all. And I'm so glad that babies don't come out of the womb walking. All right, because I, I, I'm already trying to figure out how this new life is going to look like, so I'm just glad they don't come out walking. But when our baby does begin to walk, we live in a two-story house, right? And so we're going to probably put up guardrails maybe around the stairs just to make sure that he's safe. We probably won't just leave the door wide open for him to just be able to crawl and walk outside when he wants to. This is important because these distinct beliefs that act as guardrails are designed to protect us not to hurt us. They're not designed for us to just say, oh, I can't do this, or, you know, if, if I wasn't saved, I would. 
It's not made for that. It's made to protect our unity so that we can know what we believe. And what are these uh, three core beliefs that we should believe that are laid out in verse 5? These beliefs are in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. This means that we all as Christians serve one Lord, which is Lord of our lives, not Lord of our Sundays. That we have one faith. Our faith is both now and eternally secure in the finished work of Christ, which is the only hope for salvation. And then we have one baptism. Our baptism into the life of Christ, which is also symbolized by the physical baptism by water, displays that we have been raised from death to life in Christ. And also, if you haven't had a chance, if you've trusted and believed in Christ and you haven't had a chance to do baptism, we have that coming up actually next week. You can go on our website and you can get uh, baptized. So these beliefs not only unite us as a congregation or a building here or online audience as well, this unites us throughout the world, both past and future, Every single disciple that has, is, or will trust Jesus Christ and place saving faith for him, we're united to them and we'll see them when we're with Jesus in glory. This means for a world that doesn't have hope, that's looking for something to trust in, we can tell them they're not looking for something, they're looking for someone. This leads us to a distinction of truth that we have that we see in verse 6. Because here's an important thing. As Christians, as we said with these beliefs, these beliefs aren't abstract beliefs about some kind of idea of what we think things are. We believe that truth is a person. This means that disciples are united in the distinction of truth. And when I say truth, I don't mean the truth according to K.O., I don't mean the truth according to you. I don't mean I feel this way, so this is what I feel the truth is. Because here's the thing. We live in a world that has begun to confuse the word belief with the word truth. And trust me, no one has ever made something untrue simply by believing in it. I mean, kids even know this, right? They call when they're playing doctor and all that stuff. What we call it? We call it make-believe. <laughs> This is because belief is always subject to the truth of reality as it is, all right? And that sounds kind of big and maybe a little vague, so let me give you an example of, of a story I've heard to kind of explain this. So imagine you are in the woods, and if you like me, you don't be hanging out in the woods like that, so imagine hard. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the woods, it's dark, it's cold, you're lost, you're with a group, you're all lost. You pull out your flashlight and you realize that everybody has a compass. Hooray. But everybody's compass is pointing in different directions. So imagine somebody in your group looks at you dead in your eyes and tells you, I'll respect the truth of your compass if you respect the truth of my compass. I don't care how much respect y'all got for each other, all the respect in the world ain't necessarily getting you out of those woods. <laughs> and this is important because Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is basically saying, I am the moral compass of the universe. And if you're looking to get out of the woods of your sin, the only way is in Christ's direction. That's Jesus saying he's the only way and that he's the truth. And as Christians, our united belief is only made true by the reality of Jesus' lordship. This is important because that means that as Christians, either Jesus is the Lord of the universe or he's a liar. Paul even grapples with this truth in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 19, where he says, if Christ has not raised from the dead, then we as Christians should be most pitied because we're still dead in our sins, and we have no hope. This also is saying that our faith 
isn't found in doing the right things. It's found in knowing the right person. So we shouldn't act arrogantly. We shouldn't act crass because as we saw a few weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, to know Christ is to admit that we were dead in our sins. We were living in a never-ending episode of The Walking Dead, y'all, and we had no hope. But Jesus saved us by grace through faith and gave us the gift of eternal life that we could never earn. So how dare we, how dare I operate in pride when I've been given a gift that I couldn't give myself? How do I look down on anyone when I couldn't save myself? So this is important again to remember for our unity. We have a distinction of spirit, belief, and truth, which is our foundation. But Christ has also called us and chosen us to mature. And that's also by displaying our diversity. And so let's look at uh, verse 7 uh, of the text. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So Paul wants to make sure that we realize that even in a unity that has been attained by Jesus Christ on the cross, he doesn't want that to be at the expense of the diversity of the eclectic people that he's brought together for his glory. A way that Pastor Jerome says this is, we can be unified without looking uniformed. God is not only glorified in the diversity that we have as, as an ethnic group or our experience and all of that, but also in verse 7 is saying that he's given us grace by giving us a diversity of different gifts and different measures and different ways to bring about our maturity and grow us up. So my example of this, because I've seen this play out for me here at Vision in a couple of different ways, but I want to tell you all about one person in particular that I've seen this played out with. I do not think that it would be a stretch to say that me and our stewardship pastor, Pastor Pedro Rosario, are different. I'm from the South, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 843, represent. <laughs> and Pastor Pedro is from up north, Washington Heights, NYC. I'm black, he Puerto Rican. Me and my wife is having our first child. He's raised two lovely children. I'm younger, and he is wiser and more seasoned. That's, what, that's exactly what he is. So this is so, I'm, I'm, and I'm being dead serious about this. Me and him took a leadership assessment, and we literally got the exact opposites in strengths and weaknesses. But by God's grace, he has made us an extraordinary team together. I love this man, and, and he's really helped me grow in my maturity as a husband, as a leader, and as a disciple in Christ. And I say that to say this. Thank God that God has made our brothers and sisters in Christ in his image and not yours. God has unified us but with the diversity of the gifts that he's placed in his church, we have a variety of different personalities. We have a variety of different abilities and skills. And then with those varieties of gifts and skills, we can also be able to help support one another in our weaknesses and our frailty. But more than just honoring one another, we have to honor the gift giver. And that leads me to verse 8 through verse 10. And it says, for it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. But what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And y'all, I don't preach very often, so all of that sounded a little complicated. So I'm going to give y'all the quick synopsis idea of what's happening here. So this is in relation to Psalm 68, verses 18. And the overall thing is saying that in Christ's life, in his death, and in his resurrection, that Jesus has dominion over the entire cosmos. And that he's given us grace. And this isn't the grace of salvation. This is the grace of different gifts that he's given us in various forms to do as he wants, with who he wants, when he wants, for our good and his glory. 
And this leads us uh, to verses 11 through verses 13. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the statue measured by Christ's fullness. And so Paul has given a list of particular gifts in these particular verses to equip the body for the work that he's called his church to do. So this isn't like an exhaustive list of gifts because there's plenty of other passages in the New Testament that gives us some of those gifts. But these are gifts in particular that are focused directly on leadership and knowledge of God's word within the body. And Paul also gives a warning in Ephesians chapter 5, and this is related to just life as a believer, to be wise in the way we live. And this is obviously true with the gifts that God has given us for the building up of his church. Because here's something that's of primary importance when you're thinking about gifts. Your gifts are given to you, but they're not primarily for you. They're given to you, but they're not primarily for you. The gifts are given to build up our brothers and sisters in Christ and to let a dying world know about Jesus. So here's the thing, and and they're talking about pastors, and they're talking about evangelists and all of that. So here's the thing. If you don't possess the gift or the call to be a pastor or a teacher or evangelist, maybe you should get up and shout. No, don't do that. (laughs) But I can promise you one thing. If you haven't been given that, I can promise you that if you are a believer, you have been called to be a disciple and to help make disciples. And God has given you everything that you need to be able to carry out the mission that he's called you to. And this is also why he's given these gifts that we see in this particular section of scripture. He's given these gifts to help equip the body to do the work of ministry. And that's important because I can't do it all. Pastor Jerome can't do it all, Pastor Sandy, Pastor Pedro, going and throwing all the elders, throwing the deacons, throwing a couple of leaders, throwing you two. We can't do all of the things with that small group to see the church thrive and grow. We have to do this together if we're going to walk out the calling that God has called us to, to make Jesus known here as as well as in around the world. So if you claim the name of Christ, you're not a bench warmer in the kingdom. You are called on the field. And this is important because God has someone that a church service ain't seeing, that a sermon ain't preaching to, unless you start speaking. And I can talk about this from experience. I grew up in church. People try to give me a a scripture. I'm like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, man. We did Bible studies at home. I went to Bible study. I I did all of that. But it was people, and, and this is also a weird thing. It would be people particularly at fast food restaurants in my early 20s. Like, I'd just be going to go pick up a Big Mac, and somebody would be like, hey, bro, do you know about Jesus? I'm like, what? <laughs> I, this was so crazy that one time I went to a Burger King. I'm sitting in my car. I done got my order. I'm like, I done made it out without anybody talking to me about Jesus. <laughs> this older lady walks past my car. Looks, walks back, knocks on my window. You know, and luckily it was, you know, it's an older lady. I was like, I don't think she's trying to take me out. So, you know, I put the window down. And she was just like, uh, baby, I don't, I don't know why. And I, I don't usually do this. But Jesus just wants you to know that he loves you. We need those type of believers in our world. Speaking words of prayer. Speaking the words through the Holy Spirit in relationship to other people outside of the walls of the church so that the light of Christ can shine mightily in our city. That's what Christian maturity looks like. And that's also why here at Vision, we want to do things to equip you to live out the gospel calling that God has put on your life. From our Bible study that we have on Wednesday nights, to be one, make one, right up to the rage cards. So I know that a lot of y'all have seen us do rage recipients and all of these. 
Man, these cards are an amazing way to share the gospel or just share generosity with someone. I was able to go into a store and give this to a young lady, and like three of her coworkers just stopped and started talking to me about why they no longer go to church or some of the church hurt that they experienced and everything else, right? And it was just by giving them a card and then also giving them a little gift, a little token to show them that Jesus cares deeply about you. But what happens if we refuse to mature? If we choose our individual convenience over committed community? Let's look at verse 14 through verse 16. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of speech, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. When we choose to remain immature and not recognize Christ's call in our lives, we not only do harm to ourselves, we do harm to the body of Christ. And we can see how something like this plays out in our actual physical body. There's a disease that when cells no longer want to be a part of productive growth of the body, they grow for the sake of themselves. And they literally grow and fester into the body to destroy the body instead of doing what they're called to do to actually grow and protect the body. This is called cancer. The evil one would love to destroy the church from the inside out. But he knows he can't destroy the church from the inside out. So what does he do? He uses, the, he uses us as believers, our behavior, to mock God's church. And we willingly go along with it. And we can see how this plays out all over the place. Seeing these celebrity pastors and people that have moral failures or are drunk with power and care more about prestige than preaching the word of God to other people. How the church is being divided by these political ideologies into factions and would rather serve for this kingdom here instead of the kingdom of God that lasts for an eternity. Paul has given us a timely reminder to remember who we are and whose we are. And I've heard this story. It's the story of a, of a pastor. Um, and this pastor is talking to his dad, and his dad is older, getting older. And he's having a lunch with his dad. And, uh, you know, preachers, they, they tend to be able to kind of just loosely throw around verses. So he's, in, he's talking to his dad about Proverbs. And he's like, you know, dad... Um, you know, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children. <laughs> and his dad looks at him, he was like, you know what, son, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I'm actually working on my will. And then his ears perk up, working on his will. And so they're in the state of Georgia at the time, and his dad basically tells him that he's talking with his lawyer and he's trying to figure out the will and everything, and this particular pastor has three siblings. Two of these siblings are uh, biological children, and then one of the siblings is adopted. And so as they're constructing the will, his lawyer lets him know, hey, so for your biological children, you know, you can do whatever you want with them in your will. You can cut them out. You can, you can do what you want. I'm guessing he was probably pretty scared by that. But he says, for your adopted child, in the state of Georgia, you can never take that adopted child out of your will. You can't change what happens with that adopted child. Church, we are adopted into the will of God for the glory of God. So why won't we act like it? Why won't we act and just really operate in the calling that God has given us because God wants our good. And you know what's great about adoption? Nobody's ever accidentally adopted. Nobody's ever accidentally adopted. 
You haven't been accidentally adopted into the kingdom of God. You've been called. You've been loved. Jesus knew you before you knew you and chose you. And the dying world needs to know that. Because at one point in time, I needed to know that. Not by anything that my mom said, not by anything that my dad said, but I needed to know that for myself. You, if you believe in Christ, need to know that for yourself. So God has equipped us to tell that of his goodness and what he's done in our lives for the benefit of the world. Here at Vision, we have a plumb line, and that's just basically a value that we have, and it comes actually from Ephesians 4, verse 16. One of our values here at Vision is to serve with love and excellence in mind, in unity. So my question for you is, are you connected? And for some of you, maybe this is the first time you showed up, and man, I'm thankful. And maybe for some of you, just getting in the door today was you saying, man, I'm trusting God and I'm trusting that he has a calling on my life. But for some of us, we've been showing up and letting everybody else do the heavy lifting. We've been showing up here, but not connected to the body to see us grow and mature. And for you, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I love you enough to tell you that right now you are disconnected from the only hope for eternal life. But you don't have to be. So if you're here or online and haven't trusted Christ, I love you enough to say, please, this is the most important gift. This is the most important family. And if you're in Christ, I'm not saying that life is going to be easy. I'm not saying that things aren't going to be hard. But I promise you that you will be in this with a family. The family of God as well as the family that you see in this room or maybe that are uh, in one of the online chats. So if you would, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray, God, that those that are in this room, Lord, that might be online, God, that might see this later, God, that they don't hear a young dude from Myrtle Beach speaking, Lord, but they hear the urging of the Savior through the power of your Holy Spirit that would change their lives, Lord, that would transform them, Lord. I pray for those that don't know you, God, that they would trust in the life of the only perfect man, God and man, that came down from heaven, lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, died the death that we deserve to die, but didn't just die. He was resurrected. And because he's raised from the dead, we have hope both now and for eternity. So, y'all, I can't save you. Only Christ can do that. But I promise you, if you would surrender to Christ, you have been brought and purchased in love. So, God, thank you for this time, Lord. And I just pray, God, that you would just continue to minister to our hearts, Lord, not only through this preach word, Lord, but also through worship. Um, as well as we go on through this week. In Jesus' name, amen.